In times like these, we need the armor of God for the well-being of our families, to help you stand in the evil day. The Church of God International presents Armor of God, a program of biblical understanding. And now your host, Bill Watson. Well again, welcome to another international telecast of the armor of God and as always it's good to be with all of you again. Well as you can see I'm dressed a little bit differently and this is illustrating the fact that we've got a special program prepared for all of you. As a matter of fact over the next three weeks we're going to be covering some aspects of church history, Christian church history, that we think you're going to find very interesting and perhaps very surprising. And it's very well documented. Matter of fact, we're very excited about the presentation of these next three programs in a row because they are so well documented. And we're hopeful that as a result, you'll go ahead and call your friends, your relatives, and, and family members and let them know about what we're about to present because it is going to be what you could say somewhat challenging concerning the topics that we're going to be covering. As a matter of fact, we would also like to encourage you to get your Bibles. That's right, get your Bibles because we want you to, to see these things in your Bible for what they say because so often, my friends, we find ourselves believing things about the Christian religion, believing things about Jesus Christ, when in fact, there's nothing of the sort. It's not in the Bible. Never was in the Bible. And yet you scratch your head wondering, well, how did these things come to be? This program that you're about to see is actually taken from a one-hour documentary that the Church of God International's media team put together. We're going to segment it over the next three weeks, as I said. And you're going to see some surprising revelations about three major fundamental doctrinal beliefs of the Christian Church. So get your Bibles, call your friends, call your family, and let's, while we're keying up here, get comfortable because I think you're going to find the following information extremely interesting. I'll be back later on at the end of the program with a few closing comments and some clarity on how to obtain some free offers that we have for this particular presentation. So get ready now, relax, and watch the chronicles of the early New Testament Church. Thank you. 
And upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. You know, over the centuries, Bronson, Christians have come and gone, and we are well aware of the fact that death in the grave has not conquered the church. Yet it seems to me to be a, well, a bit of an oxymoron to profile the church as a little flock in light of the fact that there's approximately, what, two billion people claiming to be Christian on this planet. That is a perplexing issue when you consider the panoramic view of the Christian community and especially with the denominational discrepancies that exist within that community. So, so how do we make sense of this then? It requires some explanation. It's a perplexing and complex issue. So permit me, if you will, to share some information that will shed a light on that. The Bible is a Hebrew document. It was primarily written by Jews, Benjamites, Levites, and a handful of other Israelites, all contributing to a variety of events and perspectives. Comparably, it was quite alien, unadorned, plain and simple when measured against the artful Greco-cultured literature and Arthenian orators of the day. The persistent social and religious pressures of this Greco-Roman culture put enormous amounts of influence on the plain and simple truth of Jesus Christ's good news, the gospel. These influences contributed to dilute the announcement of his messiahship and ultimate earthly kingdom, compromising many of the teachings and causing the church to go in a direction he never intended. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way, and then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Peter warned, But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privately shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of and through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbers not. And Jude appealed, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you, and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. So is it fair to say that confusion and division virtually started almost immediately? Yes, absolutely, Bill. When you consider the documents of what's called the New Testament, documentation of the events of the history of the church, the early first century, it's amazing in seeing all of the warnings by the writers concerning false teachers, false prophets, false teachings, that would emerge and did emerge in the very first century. And as a result of this kind of man-made traditions and philosophies and rudiments of the world, it kind of incrementally crept into the church and diluted its original purpose and intent as established by Jesus Christ himself. The Apostle John substantiates this when writing the book of Revelation around 95 AD describing the conditions of seven particular congregations that were on a mail route in the second and third chapters. Here, he illustrates the splintered condition and disarray these congregations allowed to occur. 
History proves the church began to fragment well within the first century. The Apostle John profiles this in these two chapters. Halley's Bible Handbook substantiates the Goths, Vandals, and Huns who overthrew the Roman Empire accepted Christianity. But to a large extent their conversion was nominal and this further filled the church with pagan practices. Conflicts with heathen philosophies. Even as every generation seeks to interpret Christ in terms of its own thinking, so no sooner had Christianity made its appearance than it began its process of amalgamation with Greek and Oriental philosophies, and there arose many sects, Gnosticism, Monarchianism, Montanism, Monarchianism, Arianism, Apollinarianism, Nestorianism, Eutychianism, Monophysites. From the second to the sixth centuries, the church was rent with controversies over these and similar isms and almost lost sight of its true mission. Paul cautioned, Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Jesus said, Howbeit in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of men. Full well you reject the commandment of God, that you may keep your own tradition. Bill, many of these teachings and concepts were adaptations to the Hellenistic and Mithridic movements of its day, and these movements surrounded the church of the day. Now, we cannot forget that the early New Testament church was heavily Israelitish Jews, and many of them were religiously influenced by Babylonian and Egyptian concepts that were adopted by philosophers like Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, and that promoted within the church and influenced it on ideas that really were foreign to what the Bible taught. Okay, well now give me an example of how these influences changed the early New Testament church. Well, the acceptance, for instance, of heaven as the reward of the saved uh, was a dominant presentation. They also moved into ideas of eternal punishing versus eternal punishment, quite a difference between those two, and they spun out of the concept of the immortality of the soul. And the immortality of the soul directly contradicts what the Bible teaches in both the Old and New Testaments. And when you examine these ideas, you find them marginalizing the concepts and things that Jesus taught when it came to his millennial reign on the earth, as well as misdirecting Christians from what they should be doing regarding their destiny and understanding what their destiny was in relationship to these teachings. Solomon said, For the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything, neither have they any more a reward for the memory of them is forgotten. Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. For there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave, whither thou goest. Additionally he said, For that which befalleth the sons of men befalleth beasts. Even one thing befalleth them, as the one dieth, so dieth the other. Yea, they have all one breath, so that a man hath no preeminence above a beast, for all is vanity. All go unto one place, all are of the dust, and all turn to dust again. David mentioned, The dead praise not the Lord, neither any that go down into silence. Jesus affirmed, No man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. If the scriptures are indeed true, and it is a fact that when we die, we do turn to dust, and I think it's fair to say that the scriptures do say, dust we are and dust we shall return. Mm -hmm. So with that in mind, when do the converted obtain their reward? I mean, how does it happen? Well, the first thing we must recognize and understand that the Bible speaks of a change. In particular, Job, in going through the issues of his life, contemplating his mortality, suggested 
that all the days of his appointed time he would wait until his change comes. He precedes that statement by saying, if a man die, shall he live again? The answer, all the days of my appointed time will I wait until my change, my transition comes. But this is confirmed by the Apostle Paul also in the New Testament in 1 Corinthians 15, often called the resurrection chapter. In that passage, he uses the analogy of showing the difference between celestial and terrestrial from human and spiritual. He, he, he makes this concept very apparent, even suggesting that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. And then on top of it, says that I'm going to tell you a mystery and gives a sequential order of things. He says, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. You ask about when? At the last trump. The trumpet shall sound, and the dead in Christ shall be raised, and those who are alive at his coming will be caught up to meet him. They will not precede, that is, the living will not precede those who have died. All laid out, not only in Corinthians, but also in Thessalonians. And so, as a result of this, we understand that Christ is the first fruit. And as a result of it, those who are part of Christ will be augmented into the very kingdom of God at a time. It's all about timing when you really get down to it. The Apostle Paul said, For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, Afterward, they that are Christ at his coming. Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. Look, this is quite simple. I mean, really, it's not rocket science when you come down to it. The fact is that Christ is going to return to the earth as he promised, to gather to himself the converted, those people who either have died or who remain alive, very clearly pointed out in passages in 1 Thessalonians 4, as well as 1 Corinthians 15. So as a result of this, this momentous change that is to occur in a resurrected being happens precisely in a timed fashion as described in the Word of God. So wait a minute. Now what you're saying then is that nobody's in heaven and that, nobody's in hell? That they're all just now in the graves waiting for judgment? That's what the Bible says. Jesus Christ confirms, Verily I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming, in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice, and shall come forth, they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Centuries earlier, the prophet Daniel said, And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which stands for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Unfortunately, a lot of the heathen ideas or the paganistic ideas crept into the New Testament church through Greek philosophy. And the concept that humans have an immortal soul the concept of disembodied spirits as well as transmigration of souls all came out of this pagan concept. But this should not surprise us. It goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden when Satan the devil himself taught a concept of immortality to Eve by saying, you shall not surely die. And as a result of that, man has believed the lie ever since. Well, how about that? I'm sure you found that rather interesting, especially if you are one that believes that you have an immortal soul. Because it is very common, I mean, very traditional understanding in most Christian denominations today is the fact that when you die, you don't really die. 
but that you just go on living. You're an immortal soul contained or trapped in a body. And when your body dies, you waft off, you become disembodied and go on living in a different location whether it's in heaven because you were good or whether it's in hell because you were bad or if you're Catholic, as many of you understand, you might go to purgatory until they determine what you're, you're going, what's going to happen to you or what they're going to do with you. And I'm not trying to be cute regarding that. That's just the facts. I mean, those are what some denominations, what some Christian groups believe. But I want to bring your attention before we close here to a few things in the book of Ecclesiastes just to substantiate and support what we presented to you in this first segment of church history. Here in verse 18 of chapter 3, the book of Ecclesiastes, we read, And I said in my heart, concerning the estate of the sons of men, that God might manifest them and that they might see that they themselves are beasts. Physically speaking, humankind is made of material and water, of course. And he goes on and he states here what he means by that. For that which befalls the sons of men befalls beasts. Even one thing befalls them all. As one dies, so dies the other. Yea, they have all one breath, so that a man has no preeminence above a beast, for all is vanity. All go unto one place. All are of the dust and all turn to dust again. Notice over here in chapter 9. Again, I want to just emphasize something here to all of you. Verse 5, notice this. For the living know they shall die. But notice this. The dead know not anything, neither have they any more a reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Verse 6 here, Ecclesiastes 9. Also, their love, their hatred, their envy is now perished. Neither have they any more a portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. In other words, they're unplugged, they're de-energized, they're in the grave. There's parts as portrayed in your Bible as we presented in the, in the program that illustrate that basically the dead are dead until, of course, a resurrection such as located and mentioned over here in the book of Daniel. And I'd like to turn there real quickly here in the book of Daniel. And in chapter uh, 12, we see here the prophet stating very simply that at the time of the end, Michael, he says here, shall stand the great prince that stands for the children of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even the same time. And at that time, your people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. And many of them that sleep in the dust, and that is just a polite word, Hebrew is translated to English for dead, the dead in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Now notice this, as a correlation to that, Jesus states the same thing in John chapter 5. Notice this here in John chapter 5 and in verse 25, Truly I say unto you, Jesus says, the hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God and they that hear shall live, meaning that the dead are not alive. They're not alive in heaven. They're not alive in hell. They're not alive in purgatory. They're dead. They're not going to live until Christ comes back. That's what you read in Daniel. That's what we're reading right here, the very words of Jesus. Verse 26, For as the Father has life in Himself, so has He given to the Son to have life in Himself. Verse 28 now, He says, Marvel not at this. And as mentioned, it almost as though He anticipates our surprise. Marvel not at this, He says. For the hour is coming in the which all that are in the graves shall hear His voice and shall come forth they that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. My friends, that is exactly why you've got to get the free offers that we're offering now on this telecast. We're going to be reminding you about these offers over the next two programs, next week and the week following. And again, let me remind all of you, tell your friends and your neighbors and your relatives about this particular program because next week we're going to be covering another very fundamental doctrine of the church the Christian church. But get these free offers that we're offering over the next three weeks. The first one is called The Church That Jesus Built. It's an easily readable 
little booklet in one sitting that you can consume. It's very interesting, it's very to the point, and very concise. And secondly, we have three CDs for you to be able to obtain. Simply call Church History 101, Church History 102, and Church History 103. These are three CDs. They were also mentioned there at the end of the um, telecast, or will be mentioned again at the end of the telecast in the following weeks. But both of these offers are indeed free for the obtaining, and as well, in addition, the DVD of all three segments that you will see if indeed you tune in next week and the week after called The Chronicles of the Early New Testament Church. This is a DVD, not just a CD. This is a video that you can put in your DVD player and watch the three segments we're about to present to you. Today you saw the first in your own home there at your own convenience when you can. It's free for the obtaining. The church that Jesus built, church history, 101, 102, and 103. These are three CDs, discs, that you can get. They're audio only. And then, of course, the DVD titled The Chronicles of the Early New Testament Church. All are free for the obtaining. All you've got to do is dial that 888 number on your screen, 578-8791. And don't forget about that website where there's a whole host and variety of additional items that you might be able to find very interesting and helpful in your walk with God and Jesus Christ and to help you better understand some of the deeper truths that your Bible has to offer. As we always say, my friends, on this telecast, this is Bill Watson reminding all of you, you keep on that armor of God so that you might be able to stand in these evil days. Armor of God and the free material offered is brought to you by the Church of God International of Tyler, Texas. You may write to us at Post Office Box 2525, Tyler, Texas 75710. Call toll free at 1 888 578 8791 or call 1903 939 2929 during regular business hours. You may visit our website at cgi.org or email us at armorofgod at cgi.org. We appreciate your prayers and support.